Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello, um, welcome to this webinar delivered by the IASM Trust. I'm Sarah Upjohn and I'm a physiotherapist at BAPAM. Before we begin, a few points. The content of this presentation is for information purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for legal or other professional advice and should not be relied upon as such. You can contact us about your specific situation and ISM members can contact the ISM legal team. You can't see me, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation displayed on your screen. You should also be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound or quality issues, please let us know in the question box and we'll make attempts to resolve the issues. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org forward slash webinars. So I'm going to talk today about playing related injuries in musicians. I'm going to talk about um, how frequently they occur, about the risk factors and about prevention. So here we go. Playing related injuries are um, staggeringly common in professional orchestral musicians and in conservatoire students. But um, to date, there is no research on the incidence um, for rock, pop, jazz or contemporary musicians. Um, it's very much a silent epidemic um, and it's not discussed openly. <clears throat> there's some sort of stigma about discussing injuries or sometimes seeking help for injuries. Um, and this is a big problem because the injuries that we see range in severity from inconvenient where you might have a bit of pain for a short while, you may lose some work opportunities, there may be some lost income. Um, they can also be career ending and we see everything from not being able to play from a few days to game over. Um, so this is a really important um, and significant issue for musicians. And we're just trying to open up dialogue about it. So the incidents, how many happen? Um, the literature tells us that between 67 and 93% of all professional orchestral musicians and conservatoire students will have a pain related injury at some point in their career. Um, and the reason that the number is so uh, vast between 67 and 93 is because when they were doing the research, it depended how they defined playing related injury. Um, it is now the sort of um, most common definition is an injury that stops you playing at the level that you are used to playing and would like to play for a few days. In young musicians, um, the incidence is similar. So, let's have a look. Um, I have spent the best part of eight years um, completing a doctorate at Cambridge about playing related injuries in young musicians. Um, and one of the things I did was an audit of a lot of physiotherapy notes. And the audit revealed these risk factors for playing related injuries in the children that I was working with. So the first one um, is a, a sudden increase in playing time. What I'm going to do, I'm going to just show you what they are first and we'll go back and talk about why this happens um, in a little uh, while further down the presentation. So sudden increase in playing time, introduction of new repertoire with a different technical demand. So it's not necessarily um, a new demand, something you're not used to, it's different from what you have been playing. Stress, big one. Posture or position when playing, or the setup between um, you, the instrument, the music stand, um, and the sight lines with the conductor. And this poster. We'll come back to that as well because there's some lovely things about posture in that diagram. Okay, when you're working with children, and if any of you are teachers, this is a really significant one. Immediately after a growth spurt, children are particularly vulnerable to soft tissue injury. I'll explain why in a bit. So, 
The usual mecha mechanism of injury is accumulation of these risk factors. Okay, so more than one occurs at a time, very often there's two or three at the same time. But the fact that we know what the risk factors are means that these injuries are usually preventable. So that's the really good news. All right, preventable injuries. And I think knowing, understanding what the risk factors are, um, it becomes absolutely a priority to then pay heed to that and work on prevention. Because it's much easier to not get injured than to get injured and then have to treat it and put it right. So, risk reduction equals injury prevention. Let's talk about why those risk factors do the damage. Sudden increase in playing time. You have to think about all of the times that you're playing. So it may be practice, it may be performance, it may be time in the studio, maybe time, I just refer to it as diddling about when you're playing really for pleasure. But also think about the time you're spending on computers or mobile or phones, because they add to the load that your um, upper limb in particular and very often neck structures are um, under pressure. The reason why a sudden increase in playing time is at risk is because your soft tissues and particularly muscles and tendons are not match fit if you were a sportsman. You have to get gradually fit. If you were a runner, you couldn't suddenly increase the distance you run without risking injury. Um, there's also some research which interestingly shows that the number of minutes spent practicing or the number of minutes spent performing don't carry the same risk. Performance is a higher risk minute per minute than practice. So they're not all equal. Okay, next. Okay, introducing new repertoire with a different technical demand. Um, this is to say that our muscles and tendons are only conditioned for whatever activity we're used to doing. So if we start to do something that we haven't done for a while, our muscles and tendons are not used to it and are at risk of strain or sprain from early fatigue. So it's exactly the same with any sport or dance. We're only used to doing what we do. All right. So any change needs to be introduced gradually to allow your soft tissues the chance to accommodate and an ideal way of doing this is, for example, if you have, let's off the top of our head, say a 45 minute slot to practice, you need to spend the first bit of the practice playing a repertoire you're familiar with or scale, something that your body is used to. Then once you're warmed up, then introduce the new thing before you get fatigued at the end and go back to something familiar. So even where you place it within a practice session can make a difference to how well you cope with it. Okay, next. Stress. Now, you very often cannot avoid stress. Stress is part of being alive, really, isn't it? Um, but what stress does to our bodies is most of us hold stress somewhere in our muscles. So it increases muscle activity. Um, so what this does is already your body is working harder, you reach fatigue earlier, all right? So you're already working hard. In addition to that, stress can change your posture. Um, particularly, um, I have to say at this point, it's very strange for me to do this without uh, being able to physically demonstrate something. But what happens if you hold a lot of stress in your shoulder girdle and if you are, for example, um, a string player, it can reduce the freedom of movement in your bowing arm. Okay, so it can change the sound you make, it can change the ease with which you play. Um, so it will change how you play. Alrighty. Next. When you're working with children, if you are a teacher at all, please be aware that um, immediately after a growth spurt, uh, children are particularly vulnerable to soft tissue injury. Um, and uh, some children just grow very gradually and it, it 
tends or seems not to apply to them. But the children that grow suddenly in fits and starts and grow sort of overnight, what happens, the long bones grow first and then the soft tissues have to accommodate to the new shape or length of that new bone growth. And so immediately after a growth spurt, you're relatively weaker because the same strength muscle is working over a longer distance. You are relatively less flexible because the same length soft tissue is stretched over a longer distance. And you are relatively less well coordinated. Um, have you ever seen a teenager just sort of walk into a doorway as they go through it? Or trip over their own feet and fall over? What happens is you lose your sort of internal body map, the brain's representation of where you are. And so not only are they relatively weaker, relatively less flexible, they're relatively less well coordinated. And it is not the time to make another change like put them on a big instrument because <clears throat> that will um, <clears throat> really, really, really make it hard for them. It will also, it's probably not the time to introduce much more difficult repertoire. Let them get used to their new body first. Okay. Okay, posture and position when playing. And I don't know if you're looking at this on a slightly bigger screen or a small screen, but that poster of the skeletal system, um, most people have probably seen something like it in a GP surgery or a physio or an osteopath's room. If you look at the middle picture and the right-hand picture, these two, just don't worry about the small print, but look at the shapes illustrate beautifully a spine neutral. And if you look at the middle one, the head, which is really heavy, do you know that our heads weigh about a stone? And I'm not talking about the face, which is full of sinuses and air, but the head where the brain is, that little egg-shaped bit, weighs about a stone and it is lined up there and balanced above the pelvis. And this balance really, really, really makes an enormous difference to muscle activity. And it's very sort of Alexander Technique way of looking at things. So we are looking at maintaining this balance of the head aligned above the pelvis. If you then look at the picture on the right, um, we are musculoskeletally at least symmetrical. And an awful lot of our instruments put us into an asymmetry. I think it's really important if you play something like a flute or a violin where there is inherently going to be asymmetry, that when you're not playing, you make sure to find midline again. So we're looking at whether the head is aligned above the pelvis. We're looking at maintaining or returning to symmetry. And we're looking at the length of the spine, which is really from one end of the spine, the base of the skull, to the other end of the spine at the base of the pelvis and just trying to generate as much space between those two points as possible. I'm going to put the next slide on now. Okay. So really when we're playing, and this is you know a whole week's course in itself, so in the little amount of time that we've got, I just think it's helpful to just think about the, the main things really. And I talk about them in terms of the main things because Thinking clinically, these are the structures uh, that I'm asked to treat the most often. Okay, so we think about spine neutral, think about shoulder girdle. Are you hunching up your shoulders with your shoulders um, coming up towards your ears or can you let them go? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy and the biomechanics of wrists and forearms as well. So. Here we go. I think it's really important to consciously be aware of what we're doing also when not playing because it's this cumulative loading, this adding of everything up. You need to seriously consider how much time and in what position you're using a computer or tablet or phone, how you're carrying your kit around, if you've got children, how are you carrying those? Around? Everything you do will feed into this. So, it's such a physically demanding job. 
Okay, so in this diagram, um, I wonder if I can ask you all to, to do this at home, join in at home. The picture on the left, um, she is sitting fairly slumped, and I tend to describe this position as sitting like a teenager with a bad attitude. And the picture on the far right, she's sitting up like a Victorian. And in fact, both of those generate different stresses on the spine compared to the central picture where she's sitting heavy on her sitting bones, but beautifully with her head above her pelvis. Um, I'm going to flip on to the next slide, I may flip back, I'm just warning you, I can't remember what's next. Okay, definitely. Right, so what happens to uh, us if we're sitting slightly slumped? Um, the reason that I want to talk a little bit about sitting is because an observation with the children that I was working with, particularly upper strings players and woodwind players, very often they will have a lesson standing up and they will practice standing up and then they'll go to an orchestral course and have to play sitting down and very often they've never had a lesson in how to sit. People just make an assumption that you can sit but in actual fact if you sit like the girl on the left or the girl on the right it has a direct impact on your ability to play. So let me explain. So if you sit slumped, just do it now, it is impossible to effectively use your abdominal muscles to support your air flow. It's just impossible. Um, in addition to that, uh, if you notice the position of her head, her head is going down and so it will be very hard for her if she's playing a clarinet to get the sound to come uh, forwards because it's going to be aimed between her knees really. So sitting slumped has a huge impact on breathing. Um, an awful lot of people think they must sit up straight and as soon as the conductor raises his baton you see people sort of springing into the position shown by the girl on the right. In actual fact, just have a little go now, everyone just sit up really super straight and now take the biggest breath in that you can. Okay and just breathe out. And then just sit down heavy on your sitting bones if you've ever done Alexander Technique and now take a deep breath in. And I for one can take a much bigger breath in. And the reason for that is if you're sitting in that sitting like a Victorian position on the right, you're using muscles in your back to hold you up. And the muscles in your back that are helping to hold you up are attached to your bottom ribs. So they are fixing your bottom ribs and your bottom ribs cannot um, move to help you take a deep breath in. So um, for anyone who blows any instrument, sitting like the middle position is really going to influence how you can play. If you sit uh, like the girl on the right and you're a string player what happens is your back muscles become tired so your shoulder girdle muscles join in and people end up with a lot of back pain and shoulder girdle pain so sitting particularly uh, it's worth thinking about teaching pupils how to sit rather than just assuming that they can sit in the right place another thing that makes a difference to how you can sit is your foot position um, and just have a little play I don't know if any of you are sitting towards the edge of a chair and just see what happens if you bring your feet back so they're sort of tucked underneath you a bit compared to if your feet are down and flat for most people if you bring your feet back and tucked under the chair you will tip forward slightly um, and so one way of keeping you in the central position is to ensure your feet are positioned where hers are. And you'll notice that her heels are sort of in front of her knees compared to the other two. 
that helps keep you there. So very briefly about sitting. And on to the next thing. Here we go. So musculoskeletal injuries in the upper limb. And the tissues that we're talking about here are muscles, tendons, ligaments and nerves, very briefly. Um, and so, we've gone straight onto bones, but that's okay. Um, I'll come back to the muscles and the tendons. I want to show you something really, really uh, fascinating about the forearm and the hand. So you can see the skeletal model of a hand, and this is a left hand palm facing away from us, okay? And what I want you to notice is that all of the little tiny pebbly-like bones are joining on to the bone that is nearer the thumb compared to the, the bone in the forearm that is nearer the little finger, okay? So just know that it's attached to the bone on the thumb side of the forearm. The pictures on the right show an elbow joint. And what I want you to notice, elbows, just have a little play now, bend and straighten. It's just a hinge joint. There's a bony block. You can't straighten it further than straight. And you can bend it as far as sort of your size of your biceps allows. And so this is uh, really where it says bone number five. Okay, this is called the ulna. Bone number two is the radius. And you'll notice that the ulna is much bigger at the elbow end than the radius is, okay? But somewhere halfway down the length of those bones, they swap in size. And if you go back to the model of the hand, the narrow bone on the little finger side of the hand, that's the ulna. So it's gone from being big at the elbow to little at the hand. As the radius is little at the elbow, number two, but is attached to the hand at the wrist. Now, that's a lot of words, I'm sorry, but the forearm does an amazing thing. If you all now sit and put your elbow to your side, so elbow tucked into your side, palm up, you can turn your elbow, palm down, I mean your forearm, palm down, without moving your elbow. And this happens because the radius bone just rotates the hand over. The ulna stays still and the radius rotates the hand. Okay, now why this is important is that wrist neutral, let's see what the next slide does. Okay, go back to that one, I'm sorry. Wrist neutral, the position when there is the least load on the hand is when the little finger side of the hand is lined up with the little finger side of the arm. Rather than that. I will talk about why. Muscles in the forearm. Do you know that the muscles that move your fingers mainly start up by your elbows? All right. If you look at this sort of diagram, it shows where at the wrist, most of us have quite slim wrists compared to the forearm. That's where they're all tendons. Okay? Then they become muscles which join above the elbow. So if you have your palm up and if you move your fingers, then all the muscles are the ones quite near the elbow. And you can feel them if you put your other hand on the muscles and feel them. Okay, So all the ones to do with bending the hand are on the same surface but up by the elbow of the forearm and if you turn your hand so that your palm is down and now lift your fingers up they're all done by the muscles again up towards the elbow in the form these are the wrist extensors okay so all of that fine movement in your hands is generated from muscles quite close to your elbow so you can see where the tendons are so when we talk about tendonitis in the hands or the wrists, um, it's lower down. The tenderness structures are in a very different location. So, anatomical wrist. 
I mean, the host with a neutral or restore forearm is what it generates the least loading on the soft tissues and the joints. And the thing is, we really want those long tendons to be working in a straight line rather than going around a corner with your hand going off sideways. So try and line the long bones of the forearm and the long bones of the fingers in a straight line. So hard to, okay. So musical um, athletes. In actual fact, um, there's much research to show how physically demanding your job is, and you all know this. Um, uh, and the demands are comparable to athletes and dancers, and it's useful to start thinking of yourself as a musical athlete. Athletes and dancers are about two decades ahead of musicians in understanding how their bodies work and in uh, using research strategies to prevent injury. Um, but they've already done the research, so we don't need to. So we can use, we can borrow from the world of sports and dance strategies that look after performers' bodies. So it's loads of research shows the significance of physical fitness in maintaining your health. So strength training. Um, and there's research that shows that endurance training, because what you do is an endurance event. So strength training using little weights, but more repetitions. Cardiovascular conditioning. The more cardiovascularly conditioned you are, the less injuries you get and the quicker you heal. And flexibility of soft tissues. Um, all of these contribute to keeping you musculoskeletally well. You become less vulnerable to injury and you recover more quickly. So, what we can borrow directly from dance and athletics is knowing the importance of warming up. Okay, so warm up before tune up. We're not talking about scales. So, warming up for musicians isn't a few scales, it's getting your body warm, which increases blood flow to the muscles. So walk briskly around the block, jog up and down a few flights of stairs, um, do some star jumps. It sounds bonkers because musicians are so not used to doing it, but it's really, really, really will help your performance. The next thing is during the rehearsal, notice when you have a little break, a micro pause. So it's not the break in the rehearsal, it's just those moments when the conductor is rehearsing with a different section and knowing what to do during those little breaks and what to do is let go of accumulating tension, reposition yourself, stretch out if you need to. Stretching after playing rather than before because stretching, they think, relaxes muscles, slows down um, the reactivity of muscles. So you don't want to stretch beforehand, you want to um, warm up beforehand and stretch to relax afterwards. Um, the significance of rest and recovery time. Um, rest and recovery for a working body is really important um, and uh, it's absolutely fine to have a day off and not play. It's absolutely fine. Um, and what I'm very keen on helping you understand is that there are other ways of practicing so you don't have to be playing your instrument to practice you can practice off instrument using visualization techniques um, so if you've had a really big play build in a day or two of rest afterwards it's absolutely useful in injury prevention um, the role of hydration and nutrition on keeping your body well is really important and one of my colleagues who is a physiotherapist in Sydney um, is working with orchestras in Sydney um, and treating them like endurance athletes so before a big gig they will have a carbohydrate based snack for energy and after a big gig they will have a protein based snack for muscle repair just like athletes do um, and so all of this is known we know how to look after performers I think it's um, yeah, these are strategies we can all use. Alrighty.
Next slide. Oh, thank you. That is the next slide. That's everything that um, I've prepared to say. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this um, inspiring webinar. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, if you can think of a question afterwards, um, just send them to the ISM and we'll be happy to get in contact with Sarah and, um, and ask them for you. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, the first question comes from Jane. She's asking what teachers can do to increase awareness about injuries. Okay, thank you, Jane, so much. What I think, um, my, my dream, my ideal, would be that uh, from the very earliest lessons, the notion of the importance of looking after your body as well as looking after your instrument. Everyone knows, well, if they're learning the flute, that they clean it out immediately after playing before they put it away. So I'd really love the scenario where as part of every lesson, there is some attention paid to posture. There is some attention paid to warming up. There is some attention paid to is the music stand the right height. There is some attention paid to instrument away and then stretches. So just talking about it from the get-go, not in any uh, way wanting to alarm anyone, but just so that it becomes something that is talked about. You know, looking after your body as carefully as you look after your instrument. So thank you, Jane. Thank you. And similarly, um, what can performers um, do to increase awareness about injuries? Again, I just think talking about it is the very first thing. Um, you know, these are clearly identified in the literature as risk factors. Um, and I think that we have a responsibility to each other to try and ensure people are looking after each other. You know, is it beyond the bounds of common sense that a section lead of an orchestra is also responsible for encouraging the rest of their section to practice with a CE at the end, not an SE, practice well, practice carefully, practice mindfully. So, and there's another question just coming in. Okay, just one second. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have a drink of water while we're reading the question. Thank you. Um, okay, so the question is, um, do you have any advice for musicians on looking after themselves um, in terms of eating and exercise um, when they're working non-regular hours and it's impossible to have a, a standard routine? I think um, you're absolutely right. I think antisocial hours uh, makes it that much harder. Um, is there any way you can, I mean, in terms of eating, trying to eat regularly, trying to eat healthily, and I don't mean to, you know, assume that you're not eating healthily, I'm you know, sure that you are, but trying to f put a routine into that, it's really, really hard. It's one of the stresses of the job, isn't it? Building in downtime, you know, so scheduling, if at all possible, where you have recovery time. It, it's a really difficult thing. Um, in fact, I was at a meeting where they were talking about uh, people on tour and is it possible to start you know, one of the riders being that healthy meals are provided. You know, wherever possible, eat well. If you've got a choice, choose the healthy thing. Far easier said than done. So. Um, I'm sure, well, it's almost certainly not answered your question. It's a very difficult one to answer. So. <laughs> um, the next question is, do you have any advice regarding educating orchestral management teams about this um, issue? There seems to be a culture of scepticism and you must be doing something wrong, um, which is where the stigma comes from. Yeah, absolutely, and I quite understand. Um, I think that I think change is afoot. Um, I've uh, 
spent some time with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra who are really making a beautiful effort to look after the orchestra and openly talk about uh, well-being and how they can, um, you know, the, the responsibility that the management has to ensuring the players keep well. Um, I would be more than happy to uh, talk to orchestra management about the work I've been doing. Um, I think it's really important. Opening up dialogue is the very first thing. Opening up dialogue. There's also an evidence base um, that we can point people in the right direction of. Um, all right. Okay. Let's see. Question. One second. Ooh, lots of questions. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, right, let me just try and see. <laughs> we have a little screen here <laughs> with, with writing on the, the questions that are coming in. So okay. how do we make that bigger? Um. Okay, um, with regards to correcting injuries, um, what should be looking for? In a therapist, we... right. Um, I think uh, it's really important to find um, a qualified professional, ideally with expertise in and certainly empathy for an understanding of the work you do. Um, and as a first off, I would point people in the direction of BAPAM, which is the British Association of Performing Arts Medicine. We, um, I run physiotherapy clinics there uh, in their London office. Um, they are also have clinics in Manchester and in Glasgow, um, now in Liverpool, I think, and possibly Birmingham. Um, but contact BAPAM and they will be able to, they have a list of practitioners all over the country. Um, it is important to ensure that you find someone who is qualified um, and preferably with experience and expertise and interest in what you do. All right, good luck. <laughs> And uh, as a teacher, how can I help a student with long-term musculoskeletal condition? Okay. Um, I think it's really important to liaise with the parent to know what's going on with a musculoskeletal skeletal condition. It dep obviously depends on what the pupil is. But with a condition that uh, is unrelated to playing but will impact on them quite possibly. Um, and so uh, the... Uh, it, um, without knowing more about it, my first thought, if it's a young pupil, liaise very closely with the parents because conditions like scoliosis aren't static, they can change and it's useful for you to know if changes are happening because it may impact depending on the instrument that they play. Um, so close communication with the parents and or if the pupil is older, with the pupil about what is going on medically. Um, because if they've got a condition like scoliosis, they may well be having physiotherapy or seeing doctors um, separate to playing related stuff. And it would be really useful for you to know what's going on. If you feel you can ask them, it would help. So, um. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, please feel free to, to send them in. Okay. Um, one other question there. How do you know which uh, therapy to choose? Good question. Um, I, I'm pausing for thought. As a physiotherapist, I know an awful lot about what physiotherapists do, obviously. Um, if you are uncertain of which to choose, sometimes your GP can best advise you because it depends what's wrong. If it's musculoskeletal, physiotherapy in the first instance, um, if you, or osteopathy, um, or some people find chiropractic useful, why not phone, if you're looking for a therapist, phone the BAPAM head office, describe what's wrong, and they can advise about who to see as well. They've got a really fantastic team in the office who are good at advising. All right, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for sending all these questions. Um, again, if if you have any more, um, I'm going to be here a couple more minutes. Um, 
Do you have any advice regarding literature worth reading around injuries about musicians? Yes, in actual fact, off the top of my head, no, because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, I, I, <laughs> I have tons of literature. I have just finished um, a doctorate um, and so I have read a vast amount in terms of oh, stuff in journals and also books. Um, I don't know if it's possible if you want to send um, an email address in, I promise that I will forward uh, literature back to you. And you're absolutely right, The Playing Less Hurt um, is a really good book. The other ones, uh, well, no, I'll stop there. Um, I will send stuff by email when I've looked it up. <laughs> um, yeah, just feel free to send us an inquiry at, yeah. um, at the ISM email and um, we can get in yes. contact um, and put you in contact. Um, and we can, yeah, find out more about it. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, that seems um, that seems to be. Thank you very much for sending all the questions, and thank you very much for Sarah for being here today. Um, as I said before, if you have, um, if you can think of other questions after the webinar is finished, uh, just send them through, and we'll be happy to um, to advise you and put in contact with the right people. Um, thank you very much for being here.